the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. On today's program, you will hear stories from Dan Novak and Dan Friedel. Alice Bryant answers a question from a listener on this week's Ask a Teacher. We close our show with an American story. This week, it is The Blue Hotel, Part 3. But first, here is Dan Friedel. Fans are not permitted into most places where Olympic events are taking place in Tokyo. But the games are still going on. Many sports fans have been waiting a long time for the Olympics to return to Japan. What are they to do? It turns out that Japanese fans are getting creative. Recently, one cycling fan climbed a high road to run next to Richard Carapaz of Ecuador during the men's road race. Carapaz said he did not mind seeing the fan, who was wearing very little clothing, run with him up the hill. Carapaz smiled at the fan and later won the gold medal. It gave us a sensation of somehow coming back to normality, seeing the fans there, Carapaz said later. I loved it. Fans are restricted from entering stadiums and other places where the athletes are competing. Police and volunteers are looking out for people who do not have permission to be there. Athletes, coaches, and reporters are wearing face coverings when they are near other people. But some of the events are taking place outdoors, on roads and waterways. Even during the opening ceremony last week, fans lined the roads on the way to the stadium to cheer for the athletes as they passed in buses. For the new event of surfing, which takes place in the ocean, Fans went to the beach to watch from the other side of a plastic barrier. The fans could not see the event well, but they seemed happy to be there. Other people found a way to watch the Olympic skateboarding competition. It was supposed to happen in a stadium where 7,000 people could watch. Instead, no one was there. But some fans found a way to see the Japanese skateboarders Yuto Horigome and Momiji Nishia win gold medals in their events. Two little girls came to watch and said they had to stay away from security guards who would scold them for getting too close. Some people brought binoculars so they could see the skateboarders from a long distance. One person, Tamura, said the decision to ban fans was understandable but sad. Another, Shogo Miyamoto, works in Kyoto. He came to see some of the Olympics because it is something that you wouldn't have in your home country, twice in your life. Maybe not even once. That's why I wanted to come explore the venues. There are some other chances for fans to see events. For example, the golf course has a lot of trees, but fans could look through the trees to see golfers, like Japan's Hideki Matsuyama, 
who won the Masters Golf Championship in the U.S. earlier this year. At Odaiba Marine Park, some fans recently watched the triathlon. Swimmers will compete in the open water events in the same place. People who like to watch runners will be able to see the marathon in Sapporo, a city about 1,000 kilometers from Tokyo. Although fans are not permitted, it will be hard for security guards to clear the whole path of the race, which covers 42 kilometers. The cycling events are being held in a place known as a track or velodrome outside of Tokyo in Izu. It is far enough outside of Tokyo that it does not have the same restrictions. Over 1,000 people will be able to watch at the velodrome each day. One athlete said she will be happy to have the support of fans. Laura Kenny of Great Britain has four gold medals in track cycling. She said she was gutted when she heard there would be no fans. Now that she knows fans will be there, I'm glad to have some people coming in, she said. I'm Dan Friedel. Many places in the northern half of the world are currently facing record-breaking heat. Several countries in the Middle East, including Iran, Kuwait, Oman, and the United Arab Emirates, recorded days over 50 degrees Celsius in recent months. Moscow and Helsinki, Finland, also reported their hottest June temperatures on record. Several weeks ago, there was a record-breaking heat wave in the Pacific Northwest of the United States and Western Canada. Oregon and Washington State reported almost 200 heat-related deaths. Jennifer Vanos is an assistant professor at Arizona State University. She said, Heat is different than other extremes because it's invisible. She added that when it's something people have never experienced before, then it becomes a lot more dangerous. A United Nations group on climate change says cities can be dangerous places during heat waves. City buildings and streets can make temperatures rise. And with more than 50% of the world's population living in cities, experts fear that heat-related health problems will become more common. Cities can be several degrees hotter than rural environments. This effect is known as the urban heat island. Hashem Akbari studies urban heat islands at Concordia University in Montreal. He said building materials in cities take in heat and hold it. Asphalt, for example, is a petroleum-based mixture used in streets and on the tops of buildings. Its dark surface reflects little light and absorbs heat. 
At the same time, buildings are often close together, which means there are fewer trees and plants. Plants provide valuable cover from the sun. Plants also absorb water through their roots and use surrounding heat to evaporate the water from their leaves. With fewer plants, this natural cooling effect is gone, Akbari said. To avoid the heat, people living in cities use electricity to power air cooling systems and fans. On a very hot day, those technologies use a lot of electricity. Sayanti Mukherjee is an assistant engineering professor at the University at Buffalo, New York. She said cities have a higher population to serve, so the infrastructure is working at a higher capacity because of the demand. But sometimes the electricity system is unable to supply enough power to meet the demand. If that happens, the system shuts down and the power shuts off. Extreme weather events, however, are unusual. That makes it difficult for city planners and engineers to prepare for conditions. That might not happen very often. The materials used to make urban infrastructure also are affected by high heat. Heat makes metal materials expand. Power lines, for example, are usually made with metal. Hot temperatures and high electricity demands. Cause the metal to expand and fall lower to the ground. The falling lines can touch trees or people, and can cause fires or injuries. Concrete and asphalt expand with heat too. Quick changes in temperature can create cracks in concrete. And can cause buildings, streets, or bridges to weaken. Researchers are looking for ways to help urban populations live through extreme heat. Vanos said cities should keep better records of heat-related deaths. She said these kinds of deaths. Are often underreported. Vanos added that city governments can help identify populations that are at risk and improve emergency services. Akbari said more trees and grass are needed to cool cities. He added that structures should be built with new materials that are lighter in color. And reflect more light. That would also lower temperatures and save energy. To supply energy demands, Mukherjee said cities need to use more wind and solar power. Experts say the heat-trapping carbon gases have pushed the world's climate to an extreme. The more frequent and intense heat waves are showing that we need to prepare ourselves more to address this problem in the future, Mukherjee said. I'm Dan Novak.
This week on Ask a Teacher, we answer a question from Carmen in Mexico. She asks, what are the differences between as, while, and meanwhile? Thanks for your help. Greetings from Mexico. Hi, Carmen. All three words inform us that two things are happening at the same time. Any of them can be used in place of the other when you want to express that idea. But if you are ever unsure which one to use, choose while. We can use the word while or as to connect two actions or situations that happen at the same time. Listen to the examples. While I was crossing the street, the traffic light turned red. As I was crossing the street, the traffic light turned red. But while is more common. As can sometimes sound formal or even literary. Notice that the structure of the two sentence examples is the same. Only one word changes. You can also put as or while in the middle of a sentence. For example, you can say, The traffic light turned red as I was crossing the street. Now, let's talk about meanwhile, which means at or during the same time. When we use meanwhile, our sentence structure changes. Listen to how the speaker uses it. I was crossing the street. Meanwhile, the traffic light turned red. Here you have two separate sentences describing what two things happened. Meanwhile comes at the start of the second sentence. American English speakers generally use meanwhile when we are telling a lively or funny story about someone or something. For example, American comedian Stephen Colbert uses the word on his late-night television show to recount unusual news events. Real journalists also use meanwhile in their reports. In news, it often signals a sudden change in a story's direction. And finally, note that all three words have other meanings that they do not share. That's Ask a Teacher for this week. I'm Alice Bryant. The Blue Hotel, Part 3. The men prepared to go out. The Easterner was so nervous that he had great difficulty putting on his new leather coat. As the cowboy pulled his fur cap down over his ears, his hands trembled. In fact, Johnny and Old Scully were the only ones who displayed no emotion. No words were spoken during these proceedings. Scully threw open the door. Instantly, a wild wind caused the flame of the lamp to struggle for its life. The men lowered their heads and pushed out into the cold. No snow was falling, but great clouds of it swept up from the ground by the fierce winds were streaming all around. The covered land was a deep blue, and there was no other color except one light shining from the low black railroad station. It looked like a tiny jewel. The Swede 
was calling out something. Scully went to him, put a hand on his shoulder, and indicated an ear. What did you say? I said... Screamed the Swede again. I won't have a chance against this crowd. I know you'll all jump on me. No, no, man, called Scully. But the wind tore the words from his lips and scattered them far. The Swedes shouted a curse, but the storm also seized the remainder of the sentence. The men turned their backs upon the wind and walked to the shelter side of the hotel. Here, a V-shaped piece of icy grass had not been covered by the snow. When they reached the spot, it was heard that the Swede was still screaming. Oh, I know what kind of a thing this is. I know you'll jump on me. I can't beat you all. Scully turned on him angrily. You won't have to beat all of us. You'll have to beat my son Johnny. And the man that troubles you during that time will have to deal with me. The arrangements were quickly made. The two men faced each other, obeying the short commands of Scully. The Easterner was already cold, and he was jumping up and down. The cowboy stood rock-like. The fighters had not removed any clothing. Their hands were ready, and they eyed each other in a calm way that had the elements of fierce cruelty in it. Now, said Scully. The two leaped forward and struck together like oxen. There was heard the dull sound of blows and of a curse pressed out between the tight teeth of one. As for the watchers, the Easterners held in breath burst from him in relief, pure relief after the anxious waiting. The cowboy leaped into the air with a scream. Scully stood unmoving as if in complete surprise and fear at the fierceness of the fight which he himself had permitted and arranged. For a time, the fight in the darkness was such a scene of flying arms that it showed no more detail than a moving will. Sometimes a face would shine out, frightful and marked with pink spots. A moment later the men would be only shadows. Suddenly, the cowboy was caught by warlike desires, and he leaped forward with the speed of a wild horse. Hit him, Johnny! Hit him! Kill him! Kill him! Keep still, said Scully, icily. Then there was a sudden loud sound, dull, incomplete, cut short. Johnny's body fell away from the Swede with sickening heaviness to the grass. The cowboy hardly had time to prevent the mad Swede from throwing himself upon the fallen body. Scully was at his son's side. Johnny, Johnny, my boy. His voice had a quality of sad tenderness. Johnny, can you fight some more? He looked anxiously down into the bloody, beaten face of his son. There was a moment of silence. And then Johnny answered in his ordinary voice, Yes, I... it... yes. Helped by his father, he struggled to his feet. Wait a minute now till you get your breath, said the old man. A few steps away the cowboy was telling the Swede. No, you don't. Wait a second. The Easterner was pulling at Scully's arm. Oh, this is enough, he begged. This is enough. Let it go as it is. This is enough. Bill, said Scully. Get out of the way. The cowboy stepped aside. Now. The fighters advanced toward each other. Then the Swede aimed a lightning blow that carried with it his entire weight. 
Johnny, though faint from weakness, luckily stepped aside, and the unbalanced Swede fell to the ground. The cowboy, Scully, and the Easterner cheered, but before its finish, the Swede was up and attacking his enemy madly. There were more wildly moving arms, and Johnny's body again fell away like a stone. The Swede quickly struggled to a little tree and leaned upon it, breathing hard while his fierce and flame-lit eyes wandered from face to face as the men bent over Johnny. Can you still fight, Johnny? asked Scully in a voice of despair. After a moment, the son answered. No, I can't fight anymore. Then, from shame and bodily ill, he began to weep, the tears pouring down through the blood on his face. He was too, too, too heavy for me. Scully straightened and spoke to the waiting figure. Stranger, he said calmly. We're finished. Then his voice changed into that deep and quiet tone, which is the tone of the most simple and deadly announcements. Johnny is beaten. Without replying, the winner moved away to the door of the hotel. The others raised Johnny from the ground, and as soon as he was on his feet, he refused all attempts at help. When the group came around the corner, they were almost blinded by the blowing snow. It burned their faces like fire. The cowboy carried Johnny through the piles of snow to the door. Inside, they were greeted by a warm stove and women who took Johnny to the kitchen. The three others sat around the heat and the sad quiet was broken only by the sounds overhead when the Swede moved about in his room. Soon they heard him on the stairs. He threw the door open and walked straight to the middle of the room. No one looked at him. Well, he said loudly to Scully, I suppose you'll tell me now how much I owe you. The old man, with a dull expression, remained calm. You don't owe me anything. Mr. Scully, called the Swede again, how much do I owe you? He was dressed to go, and he had his bag in his hand. You don't owe me anything, repeated Scully in the same unmoved way. I guess you're right. I guess the truth would be that you would owe me something. That's what I guess. He turned to the cowboy. Kill him! Kill him! Kill him! He repeated in the tone the cowboy had used. Then he laughed. But he might have been laughing at the dead. The three men did not move or speak, just stared with glassy eyes at the stove. The Swede opened the door and passed into the storm giving one last glance at the still group.